Roll call. Mr. Albrecht? Here. Mr. Brown? Here. Dr. Hall? Here. Mrs. Roop? Here. Mr. Ture? Aye. Uh, here. Mrs. Galbraith is here. Mrs. Gasparo? Here. Stand for the pledge. Mr. Albrecht, would you read the mission statement, please? Our mission statement, to ensure that every child is challenged to reach his or her full potential academically, socially, and emotionally as they grow and develop into thoughtful, productive, and contributing members of society. Thank you. How many public comment forms do we have? Are these in the order that you got them? Are these in the order that you got them? Okay, public comment. First up, Jamie Healy regarding questions about facility design and pricing process. Welcome. Oops, sorry, three minutes because there's a lot of public comment. Tonight. And I'll let you know when you have 30 seconds to go. I'm here today to ask the board to slow the implementation of the facility plan and to perform responsible due diligence on this project. The district's consultants, Healy Bender Architects, has identified $49.6 million in necessary costs in 2019 for life safety and preventative maintenance repairs in just the elementary buildings. If that number were realistic, these schools would not currently be open. This repair number is coming from the consultant that stands to collect the majority of the $6 million in design fees reflected in the new budget of the new buildings. That budgeted design fee taken with the additional 1.3 million in design contingency represents 11% of the hard construction costs. This pricing structure is from a contract that was, designed, or that was signed in 2004 and amended only in 2008. That's 10 years ago. Were additional design consultants brought in to provide the competitive pricing to determine if this pricing is reasonable? Were the repair estimates vetted by third-party contractors that don't stand to benefit from the design fees from the new buildings? From the information received so far, it does, appear, it does not appear that there has been any competitive review of the design pricing. Also, we are basing the extension of our current debt service by 16 years on a budget price provided by one general contractor, Pepper Construction. Mr. Surma, who is in charge of the pricing and construction for the district, also worked with Pepper Construction on a failed referendum in Hinsdale District 181. Have other general contractor, contractors been brought in to provide opinions and budgets? Construction project management best practice involves engaging multiple contractors to confirm that the pricing is realistic and also to identify areas where the scope provided by the architect needs to be clear or, or areas where more information is needed. It appears at this point pricing is based only on conceptual design. Mr. Surma said at the September 10th meeting with Dr. Coglanis that the next step is to start the programming of the new buildings. The difference between conceptual design and programming with actually identifying numbers and sizes of classroom locations, ancillary rooms, et cetera, can be enormous. The fact that we're moving ahead with the facility plan based on a budget where we have not even determined the final scope of the project borders on negligence. We ask that the district take the time to perform the most basic level of due diligence regarding the numbers being shared. The board is not receiving adequate, properly vetted information that's required to perform their fiduciary responsibilities to the taxpayers. There are numerous cases for concern in how this large project is being handled. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Dawn Joyce. Um, Future Ready 2022 flyer and website answers regarding IB. Yes. Hello. Specifically, this beautifully made flyer that's totally misleading uh, in terms of reviewing the answers on your website. 
Uh, so you claim on this flyer the first two items listed as exciting benefits of the plan are about providing access to the IB program to all students. You admit that the benefits of utilizing the IB model has clearly been proven to be successful. However, the reality is that if this plan moves forward, there will be some number of years where there will be no IB program at all because we will need to reapply for candidacy. Then imagine my personal shock when three separate times on the website, the answers to questions relating to the IB program use the word if, if the decision is made, if the board chooses to include the IB program. The first two line items you're using to sell this program, this plan, are ifs. This is totally misleading, and this is what you're distributing to the community. And second, in the section at the bottom entitled By the Numbers, you've conveniently not included any amount for life safety costs and preventative maintenance on the new construction buildings. You allocate $62.8 million for the current buildings over the next 20 years and $0 for the new construction buildings over that same period of time. I can only assume that number wasn't included on purpose to make the cost difference seem significantly larger than it actually would be. This is misleading, yet it's what you've chosen to distribute to try and get people to support your plan. You say your voice counts, you say we want your feedback, and then you turn around and say we don't need a referendum of your votes because we had the votes of the community back in 1993 and 1999. Those ridiculously old votes do not reflect the current community. So if you really did want this community's feedback, you would put it on a referendum to be voted on by the current community, the majority of whom in terms of parents were not even of voting age in 1993 and 1999. The community that placed those votes no longer exists. And if you had borrowed and spent the money on the schools then for their children, not 25 years later, maybe we wouldn't be in seconds. this current situation. Thank you. Next is Neil Boot regarding the need for new schools. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Neil Boot, and I've lived in the Crete area since 1971. Um, I want to tell you what happens to these when you start putting more taxes on us. My home is not a palatial palace. I end up paying for my own sewer, my own water, and I pay my garbage pickup, and yet my tax bill is over $8,000. You are going to put people out of their homes by keeping up more and more taxes. You know, uh, of the $8,000 that I pay, the school tax is $5,469.55. That's over 70% of my bill goes to 201U. And I can't do anymore. All you're gonna do is force more and more people to look towards our neighboring states. And they're already doing it. My own son, who graduated from Crete Moni, said, I can't pay the taxes here, Dad. I have to move. And he went to Indiana. Property taxes are crushing the middle class. And Illinois property tax owners pay the second highest in the country. We're, we're right behind New Jersey, of all places, huh? New Jersey. Who the heck wants to go to New Jersey? <laughs> you want to raise taxes? Let me ask these people here. here. Who in this group wants to see your taxes go higher? Sir, you need to address the hand. board. Sir, Sir, you have to address the board, not the yeah. audience. All right. Thank you. Then I'm addressing the board. Those people behind me could raise their hands if they want their taxes raised. <laughs> Property taxes eat up about 6.4% of the household income. It's like having a second mortgage. Property taxes have gone up since 1993, 0.3 times higher than the average in this country. There may be some safety and health issues at the schools, 
but I don't think tearing them down. If I got a bad pipe in my house, I don't tear the house down, I replace the pipe. I'll tell you, the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago recently had a statement in the, in the Tribune. It said that in order to get past all these taxes that the state of Illinois own, owes, both their pension and just the bills they haven't paid, we would have to add 1% to the estimated value of every home and add that to the tax bill. So in my case, you'd be adding about another $2,000 if my home was at 200,000 on top of the eight. So now I'd be paying 10 and it would take 30 years to pay that off. I want you all to think about what it is when you sit there and think about raising the taxes, passing these bills. I want you to think about it deeply and what it does to those of us on fixed incomes and those of us who are the senior people. And I'm one of those senior people. Thank you, thank you sir, time's up. Thank you. Okay, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I didn't know that we're keeping time over here, so I'll stop doing what I'm doing. Did you start it at a different time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the screen? It's not. Natalie, what time do I you wanted to say I'm one of the older people. You see, I was around when the no, Dead Sea was only screen? sick. <laughs> I didn't hear what he said. Okay. Who's? Okay. Yeah, there's a timer up there. So. Usually the timer's behind us, we didn't realize that. Next up is David Sevier. Um, why not a referendum for the public to decide instead of, I don't, do I need to read? Yes, you're, I, you're gonna do it, okay. They kind of covered that. I well, think the last two speakers done a good job. They kind of covered the majority of that. Uh, but I, I guess my question comes to the point of where when we ran the referendum for the high school back then, there were two questions on the ballot. One was for the construction of the buildings. The second one was for the maintenance and the operations for these facilities. The voters voted that down back then, but at least they were given the opportunity to make the choice. In this case, you're making the choice for us and you're putting these taxes on us. As the gentleman said, 70% of his tax bill is the district. At what point does the district give us relief, especially since the education process is not where it's at, but the dollars keep going up, the programs are not changing, and the curriculum surely is not changing. So we continuously pour dollars into 201U. We continuously look for curriculum changes. They don't occur. The fight to put that IBO program in here was a fight. Everybody who has been around since that program came in know that it takes at least a year and a half to possibly get the approval to become an IBO program. And it's not going to be in every building because it has to be certified building by building as well as classroom by classroom. So you're sitting around and you're telling us that you're going to be able to do these things without doing the research. We cannot continue to pay the increases that Creek Monique 201U is requesting without getting the quality of education out of the district. That's more important to me than spending all this money on new buildings, which are not going to change the curriculum. You're not going to reduce staff. You're going to reduce classroom sizes to increase staff to keep staff around. So you reduce it down to 20 so you can have teachers in the classroom. Even if you made it 25, that would at least reduce the staff. Show us where you can cut dollars before you start asking for money. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Bri Brianne Wary. Did I say that correctly? Okay. I'm asking the board to provide a referendum regarding the restructuring plan. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. I'm here tonight to ask the board to give the voters a referendum regarding the school restructuring plan. I've been attending meetings in person and online. I've seen many stakeholders 
have their questions deflected and unanswered regarding this plan. And I personally feel that this current plan is not backed by research in the best interest of the children and how they learn and develop in the primary years. I was a little inspired by my own board member, Mr. Mike Ture, a board member since 2013, whose bio reads, he wanted to serve on the school board because he believes children truly are the future and they need voices of reason and common sense in their corner, as do the taxpayers. It was a short three years ago he himself wanted a vote on a $34 million bond issue, a little over a third of the current $84.5 million plan. In August of this year, after hearing about pushback on social media, a list letter from Mr. Teray gets posted saying that the old plan was not financially sound. Yet we have bonds planned for this one. I would like to quote him from 2015. The district wants to borrow another $34 million to spread the existing and new debt over 20 years without the possibility of property tax relief, which of course costs everyone more and chases people to Indiana rather than keeping them here, knowing that their property taxes have no chance for the next 20 years of reducing. My question tonight is what has changed? Why is a plan that asks for over $50 million more than the previous one more sound? than the last. Why do you not want to give the voters a referendum? It doesn't sound like common sense to me, and it seems that the voters and taxpayers in District 5 have lost their so-called advocate. Tonight, thanks to Section 28 of the Illinois Election Code, you have the power to vote right now during this very meeting to put the question on a ballot. Let the people speak. We need a referendum. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's it's an, another public comment from Mr. Sevier. Okay. Next up, Johnny Rice Jr. or Senior? Okay, Junior. Local schools being pulled out of neighborhood. Welcome. I don't want to really continue on about the referendum. I do believe it should be in a referendum. I don't believe that we should be even losing our local schools. Uh, it brings down the property values of, the, of the, the schools that's being affected. Then I don't really think you care about that, but you bring down the property taxes, property values, you lose money, okay? We're, we're already stretched in. My neighbor who's, who's retired is going to pay more money. She can't afford no more money. And one last comment. Uh, when we, last time we had a meeting, we had one of the board members make a statement. If he wants to run for higher office, I suggest that that person does that and refrain from these comments that he was making at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Heather Van Zill. Did I say that correctly? I'm sorry? Regarding why the systematic dismantling of CSK, the one school that is universally held in high regard. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Ms. Heather Van Zyl. I've been a parent at this school for the past 11 years. Um, it's been a marvelous experience for the four children that I have, two I've sent all the way through, four, two more who are here right now. Um, I've been here almost since the beginning when the board made the decision to create CSK, asked staff to become risk takers, asked parents to become risk takers, and we were. And we came in and we, we bought in and we built up this school. And I know some of you have had students, your own children who came through this school as well. And um, as I can, as I hear from community, I see on, on social media, um, CSK really is the school that people continue to put their stamp of approval on. And our district has a PR problem we have for a long time. And I don't think that's a fair 
um, assessment of the other schools, I have children, like I said, at the middle school, at the high school, and they're thriving and they're doing well. But the fact is, is that CSK is the one that people, whether they've had students there or not, who I see in the community saying CSK, CSK, CSK. And yet, over the course of just the 11 years that I've been here, it's gone from being a K-8 school to being a K-6 school, to being a K-5 school, to going away completely. And I just don't understand how a school that can be, that is performing well, that is successful, that has had staff just pour themselves into a new idea and a successful idea and parents who have worked so hard to bring us where we are to just, again, now just walk away from it completely. And I just, every time another grade gets chopped off, I think, I don't understand, I don't understand, I don't understand. Um, and here we are where it's about to go away. And um, I understand wanting to have IB in all of the schools. It's a wonderful program. I appreciate that you've moved it towards the middle school. But like we're saying, it's starting over. We were the first school. CSK was the first IB school certified in the state of Illinois. And we're just going to throw that away? That's just going to be gone? You know, this is something that we're proud of. We should be proud of. We are proud of, but not proud enough. It's just going to go away and, and you're going to start over. And why, why start over? If you want to, the old plan, you were going to add a grade level to each, each um, or a classroom to each grade level. I think that's wonderful. You know, you can start to feed people in or we can start another one if you want to start at another school and start the process and we can build it up that way. But to just dismantle it as if it didn't exist and to start all over does not make sense to me. And I um, am disappointed, I am frustrated, and um, I'm just sad. I'm just sad that it'll just be one more thing that people will be like, oh, cream money, you know, they can't even keep their good school. And I, I just, it's, it's tiresome. And I've been a champion for this district. You can ask these people who I am here with. Anyway, sorry, I went too long, longer than I meant to. Um, so I just would ask that you would keep CSK. I think you get a big, these big schools, you can't know and be known by your teachers, by families, and I'd like to keep a family environment for everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. This is yours. Does that say Chris? Yes. Chris Brown? Larson. Larson I'm yeah. sorry. Um, I, 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 I'm just going to have to well, let you say what it says because I can't read it. I apologize. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. uh, uh, as a professional who works several miles away, uh, it was a bit of a struggle to uh, get here and file paperwork on time to, to have this address. Uh, first thing that I'd like to ask is that Lyle Neal stop playing with his computer. As a person in the IT field, uh, I understand uh, that we have multiple tasks to work on, uh, but I do believe that the uh, information that you're going through or games you're playing on that computer do not in any way it's ridiculous. These people are here to express their opinions, and we ask that you pay attention to us. <clears throat> I apologize. Okay. My concern with the plan in general is that we are allocating millions of dollars to phys physical education facilities, which in itself is not terrible, but it really does not speak to the needs that we have as a community. STEM programs, math, science, these are the cornerstones of our competitive society today. We do not want to run around in circles, literally. We want to compete with the best that our region, our country, and our world has to offer. I am making great pains to make my children competitive, to make them have a livelihood that cannot be taken away, that cannot be outsourced, that cannot make them 
I mean, let's be frank. When you talk about the physical education versus the versus math and science, you're talking about skills. You're talking about things that do not go away with age. They do not go away with uh, any of these uh, injuries. I'm concerned that in um, in education. You need to go and recruit the best. I'm concerned that in education, you need to have the best programs. I do not believe that this district does. I do believe that this school that we're in has tried. And I do believe that this school provides a lot of these things. There's a waiting list to get in here. It It's a good school and the education that we should get here should focus on using the money appropriately, and I don't think that's been addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, administrative updates. Dr. Kara. All right. All right. I've got a few updates. I'm oh, sorry. Is that all of the public comments? Yes. Oh, that was all. You know, mm -hmm. No, it's seven o'clock. Do we start at six thirty? And I believe we lost time with you shuffling through papers and and some mishaps. So the forms that were received by the time we started were all gone through. Everything that was received when we started, we went through. Once we start the meeting, public comment forms can't be accepted. That's not true, Jennifer. That is not true. Got here and turned it in. And according to my watch and my cell phone, we still got two minutes. Natalie? Did you like to hear what you had to say? Yes, I was. Yes. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. I want to remind you because I was going to time stamp it because she wasn't here. So I wasn't taking a public comment from someone else or someone else. I told her when she comes, tell her to submit it if she makes it in time. I said it's 6.59 on my laptop. I wasn't taking one from I'd like to know what time we started public comment. Shouldn't have a problem letting this one person. No, it, it, that's should fine, Miss Hudson. Do you still have your form? Should not be an issue. Well, the rules is not being followed right. It's not no, seven the, o'clock. The, the forms wasn't received by me by the time we started. They were. They were. Yeah. The policy says once the meeting starts, okay. Let her speak. We will discuss this at our committee, the whole meeting. Ms. Hudson, you're next. Good evening. My name is Cynthia Hudson, as you all know. I would like to, first of all, thank the board for finally listening to me and have their meetings in the different communities. I believe that it's as, as a result of when you all came upon this decision of your plan to dismantle these communities, dismantle these schools, I did ask you, why is it that you didn't conf uh, inform the communities before you came to this conclusion? I told you all, the communities need to be informed now, immediately. You all said, in October. I'm glad you didn't wait till October. I would also like to say I agree with pretty much everything that everybody has said. You all are taking one of the best schools in the district and you want to close it. It's in an African American predominantly minority community. Then you want to take a second minority community 
that's two out of four of your communities that you serve, you want to destroy their communities by taking out their home schools. When you take out these schools, you're destroying their property values, you're destroying their community. Park Forest will have to send their children to school 13 years, their entire school life, from kindergarten through 12th grade. University Park will have to send theirs out 10 out of those 13 years. Like I said before, if you don't remember, I am one of the original plaintiffs in the lawsuit that it took us 10 years to win the first time. I don't mind and I will be a plaintiff in the second lawsuit. So if this is what you all are trying to do again, it won't happen as long as I'm around. Amen. I want to also stress that your mission statement, when it's talking about the stability of the emotional and social um, stability of the children, where's the stability when you're constantly relocating these children out of their communities? You know, they're on the bus for a longer length of time. They have to lose sleep because they have to get up early to ride this bus to and from. So are you taking the families into consideration? I don't think so. I've asked you all. You all are up here as a board. You serve four communities. University Park, Park Forest, Moni and Creek. Not just Creek and Moni. So when you do this plan of yours, you're looking to destroy University Park and Park Forest while you build up Creek and Moni. And you want, you're trying to make us pay for it over the next 20 something years. That's unacceptable. Your time is up, thank you. Ms. Galbraith, I requested the time. What was the call to order time? 6.30. At 6.30? Yes. Yes, ma'am. And our public comment form says that once the meeting starts, that no more um, forms will be addressed. So then we need to be consistent with that because you've accepted people after they, the meeting has started, the public comment. They were given to me in order, and I did them in order tonight. Superintendent, update. Um, I have about five items to update the board on. Uh, the first one is a special congratulations to our EC program. Uh, we did receive notification from Illinois School Board and of Education that said our early childhood program received the Gold Circle of Quality Award. So certainly hats off to our early childhood program and the team there. Dr. Coglanese, is there a reason why we do not have around the district on the agenda where we could properly recognize our schools? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Is there a reason why we do not have the around the district agenda item on tonight's agenda where we can properly recognize our school. Are you referring to a good news report? Good news. This around is the just a superintendent's update. Right. So I'm saying, what is the reason we do not have that on the agenda? It's under the superintendent's report, ELC recognition. It's Separately, on the agenda. We put good news as an agenda as item. As the board president, I looked at the agenda. I discussed with Dr. Coglanis, good news report, and until our meeting times come down in length, we will give updates as necessary. Okay, so our schools miss out because we're trying to save a couple of minutes? We're giving the update now. There is an update So normally on the we agenda. allocate 15 minutes, just so you all know, to properly recognizing our school. So you answer my question, thank you. The second item uh, that I was going to bring up is we have had some uh, the coffee with Dr. Karas that came out earlier this month. We had a September 6th and a September 10th uh, that were out there at the high school as well as at CSK. And I know there are many 
folks that were able to attend that meeting. Those were also videotaped that are on our new website. Um, and there is a survey available for those that would like to take it, as well as give comments um, on that site as well. The third item is Parent University. That is going to be uh, a special time uh, provided on October 2nd for members of the community to come in and observe a panel presentation with open questions, but then also have an opportunity to participate in about three different sessions on a variety of issues that are pertinent to parents, such as technology safety and so forth. So we're looking forward to that. Our fourth item is discussing our surplus sale. This last weekend, there was a lot of folks that came together to help uh, revisit some of the items in the sixth grade center. Um, and those items went out to families that came in um, and were able to pick those up. It was a very successful day. And certainly we wanna thank our staff, our students, our board members that participated in helping that take place. Um, it came to my attention that we do have a sign outside the facility that basically said, future ready, um, a new you is coming. And I wanted to make mention to that. Um, the focus on that sign was about the vision and it wasn't about a facility that had been decided on at that time. So I certainly wanted to clarify that if anybody saw it in a different way. The future of the district is future ready and we are focusing on a new tomorrow in developing STEAM, like we had talked about earlier, as well as cultural competency and a variety of other pieces. So those are the things that we're really focused on in becoming future ready. Um, and then our next board meeting uh, next month, we will be highlighting our school over at Talala. So we'll be at Talala next month. Will that be under your report or will that be a separate good news report? Which item? Talala. You said we're recognizing Talala. Well, I just meant we're, that the board meeting will be there. Dr. Coghlan, yeah? The, the board meeting will be at Talala. We're rotating sites for the board meeting to try to get out into the, the various buildings. So the board meeting so in October. So the next board meeting will be at Talala. Correct. I thought you were saying we were recognizing Talala. Did well, you use that we're word? going to be at that school. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Coghlan. Yes, yes. Did you receive a resolution from Park Forest last time? Did they give you a copy? I did not. You did not. Did you know anything about it? Other than the, that it was stated at the board meeting. What? I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, at their There was a resolution. Last I did not right receive at, that. Okay. So the mayor, the village mayor did not. I did not receive contact it. Contact you. No. You don't know anything about it. Other than what I saw at the meeting last night. But you didn't hear it being presented. I did. You, not. Okay. Thank you. What was it? A resolution to support schools. Yeah. Business. Oops, sorry. Business. Mr. Sermo, University Park TIF. Just it? wanted to give an update on the uh, TIFs, uh, specifically the TIF at University Park. As the board knows, back in June, um, I requested some information from University Park, their financial records, concerning their TIFs. Um, they did not have them at that time. They said it was going to be completed and done uh, by the end of July. I then requested another, uh, uh, sent another request to them on August 21st, uh, requesting their financial data. According to my report, uh, at the time of the writ wrote, there's a the report for the board meeting. I did not get a reply. However, I did get a reply to that, that they do not have those financial records and they're looking to have those done and approved by the board at their November meeting. So um, um, I will then talk to them and see if I can get their financial reports of those TIFs. Um, the other thing that I wanted to report to the board is on TIF 3 in University Park. That is set to expire or dissolve this year. Uh, so I have requested from them some information um, to see what that process is to make sure that we're able to capture that and that EAV once that um, TIF is dissolved. Um, I have contacted the county clerk who also stated that they're not able to do anything with that TIF, dissolve that TIF without a resolution from University Park. 
So um, I've contacted them by letter. Um, I'll be contacting them also by phone. I haven't done that yet, but contact them by phone uh, to talk to them about what their process is going to be so that we can make sure that we capture that and get that revenue from the dissolved TIF. That revenue totals somewhere between four and five hundred thousand dollars on the next uh, tax levy. So we just want to make sure uh, we capture that and that that TIF is properly dissolved so the county clerk can register it in that. So it's just staying proactive on that. So I just wanted to let the board know that, uh, and I continue to work with University Park for that too. Uh, you have been pounding University Park with the TIF as far as trying to obtain some surplus. Here you're talking about the expiration of TIF 3, I believe. Yes. What was the base here? I thought there was some not clear statements made as far as the base year. Was it 93 or 98? The base year is 1993. So it's 25 years. So it's, yes, it's 25 years. And then it can, it can stay on, from what I understand, it can actually stay on like another year. So actually, it, I thought it was going to be expiring last year, but it's really not. So it's this year that it is, it is expiring. The county clerk has confirmed that also with okay. me. And okay. That, but prior to just the expiration of this particular TIF, we were, the board, the board majority was going after University Park for TIFs, specifically to see if there was surplus to pay us the school district back. Right? What, well, I don't know if we're going after them at all. I don't. I, I don't know if I agree with that terminology. What What I'm requesting. What is, else can we say? I what, agree. What I'm requesting is their financial audits that are for that what are, for, for what reason? For the re, for the reason of of number one that they're supposed to be filed with the controller and they never have been. That's number one. And number two to see is if there is an inappropriation of funds where funds were transferred from the TIF account to the operational accounts and that. Now, as I shared with the board, and according to an article that appeared in the Tribune uh, by the village manager has stated that he believes there were some funds that were transferred inappropriately, approximately $7 million of that. Um, and they're looking also through their audits to see if there were any additional funds to see if there's documentation to support the transfer of those things. So we got other higher powers to be looking into the TIFs at University Park. That's correct, right? FBI, when you say whatever, other higher powers, I, I think other so. authorities. I, I think they are. I think okay. they are, yes. But still in all, we are pressing the issue to see if there's inappropriateness going on with University Park regarding TIF. That's what you just said. I, I, what I'm saying is that I've requested from them their financial okay. reports that they're mandated to have completed. Okay. And so we know for, we have been told, and I did ask you before, mm -hmm that Moni had $600,000 in surplus TIF money at one point. And I asked you to look into that. Did we do that? Yes, and if you, if you look at their report, that $600,000 has been earmarked for additional either loan payments in that, that are within that TIF area that, that they, are, they are able to, uh, to do. And, and so that does not become surplus money. Okay, but it was it was brought to the board that it was surplus money at one time, but I never got a full answer back oh, saying wow. exactly what that what they did with the surplus. So, right. all right. So, can you, in a formal manner, provide to the board that six hundred thousand sure. dollars that was seen as surplus from Moni sure. TIF, the specific TIF, and what the surplus money again, as you just stated, was used for? I appreciate sure. it. I can do that. Thank you. And let me uh, just backtrack to what Mr. Brown asked you in regards to going after University Park. You said you didn't agree with that. So are you saying there were not conversations where board members asked about possibly suing University Park? There were, there were comments that were made in public by some yes. board members concerning the possibility of suing University Park. Okay. However, Prior to doing that, and through the advice of our lawyers, because we did, that was why we contacted the lawyers, right? As per requested by some board members, right? Okay, right. all right, just, yes. just you know, because the way you answered that kind of seemed like we were not, or at least some people didn't want to go that route. Oh, okay. So that's the clarity of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? FOIA report, District Affairs. 
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Because I, I don't hear myself. Thank you. There were three um, FOIA requests for the month of August. August 001, please provide me with records sufficient to show all cases where Creek Monique Community Unit School District 201U paid a plaintiff or plaintiffs by verdict, settlement, or satisfaction as a result of a sexual misconduct or a sex gender discrimination claim from January 1, 2008 to present. Catherine Smizer, NBC5 Chicago, Bill August 17, 2018, 3.5 hours to complete. August 002, all official life safety compliance reports on every school within CMSD 201U sent to the Regional Superintendent of Schools and or the Illinois State Board of Education for the following school years, 2015 to 2018. James Young, Bill August 28, 2018, no documents responsive to this request, one hour to complete. August 003, a copy of the budget for the theater for May 2017 through August 2018, including all income and expenses received at the district office. Also the same for the 2018-2019 school year to include the money spent on all plays, musicals, and theater fest traveling. Deborah Pevion, Bill September 11, 2018, three hours to complete, and that completes my FOIA report for this evening. I have a question. August 002, FOIA ID number. You're saying that there's no documentation that states that we provided an update to the regional superintendent for those years asked and requested 2015 through 2018? That is correct. So we, I'm sure if we go back and look through the action plan for 2013 or 2014, all the way to 2019, five years. We didn't do any work in 2017. Is that what we're saying? And we didn't have any documentation. We are supposed to update the regional superintendent on a yearly basis regarding our life safety action plan, our progress. So we don't have any documentation for that? That is correct. You need to give the board, the board an answer why we do not. Did we not do it? Did we not do any work? Did we hold back? I thought that was a continuous, that was an action plan. We had work in each year and we supposed to provide the regional superintendent a progress report yearly on where we are. I will this defer that to at yes. this time. Yeah, you can only report on the FOIA. So Dr. Coglinis, if you will. Look into that and get back to us with your um, weekly update on Friday, please. Mr. Brown? I'm sorry. In her weekly update on Friday? Please, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's the FOIA report. Thank you. Curriculum, academic data report. Thank you. Um, I'm going, yeah, if you, if you want to go out here, I'm going to get up and head over that way so I don't block the view of the of the screen so Okay, thank you and welcome everybody. I've been kind of 
teasing people because I usually do this in the auditorium, so I'm feeling a little awkward here, and I know we have a smaller screen, so I'm gonna stand over on this side so everybody can kind of see the screen. Um, this, oh, okay, this is uh, our annual academic report. Um, I'm doing a little bit differently this year. Um, I'm actually doing it over three meetings. So we're gonna start with this first one. And uh, what I wanna do first is set the context um, because we're in a new era of accountability uh, at the state and the federal level. So the landscape right now is that No Child Left Behind is out. Um, Every Student Succeed Act or ESSA is the new federal law for, um, for schools. And then we also have at the state level, we have our evidence-based funding um, and both of those new pieces are based on two, basically two themes. One is equity and access, and the other is a focus on the whole child. And with both of those comes a new accountability system. Um, the accountability system, if you remember, under No Child Left Behind, it was basically, we took the state assessment and that determined how we were doing as schools and we would get, uh, you know, we could get ratings, we could get designations, we could be classified as underperforming and those types of things based on te one test score. Uh, the new accountability system is focused on multiple measures. It has both academic data and also student success indicators. And the other shift at, that's part of it is under the multiple measures, growth, student growth now counts for 50%. Before, it didn't count at all. So now we're up to 50% having to do with how students grow. Um, there's also with this a new definition of college and career readiness for high school students. And then also with the system, our new school performance designations that will be coming out in October. So tonight, um, I wanna go over some academic data that is basically for all students that we assessed last year. Um, we'll do that this month. Then I'm gonna come back in October and I'm going to do a presentation on just what does this accountability system look like under ESSA. And then in November, I'm coming back because at the end of November, uh, the school report cards are released. And with the school report cards, not only comes our uh, assessment data from the state level, but also our school designations if there are any. So we're gonna kind of do a three-step process here. I think the biggest difference here is tonight I'm presenting academic data for all students that we assessed. And in November on the school report card, those will be the students that the state counts toward our school report card and our um, any school designation. So it's not necessarily all students because if somebody moves in after a certain date, they're not counted. So there's a difference between what you're gonna see tonight and what's gonna happen in November. Whoops. So the first thing I wanna just quickly go over is the difference between proficiency and growth. Proficiency is kind of what everyone's used to. It's that one test, how are students doing compared to a benchmark at one point in time. Um, growth, however, looks at how much students learn or grow across a period of time and using multiple assessments. And if you look at the little diagram there, you'll see that the way to get more students to be proficient is to increase their growth. So again, that's why the system is going to a, more of a, a focus on growth and a growth model. So tonight we're gonna look at, we're gonna basically look at three things. We're gonna look at the PARC test that we gave uh, last spring for grades three to eight, again, all students. We're gonna look at the PSAT that we gave in grades nine and 10. That is a local assessment, soon to become a state assessment. And again, all students. And then we're gonna look at SAT, which is our grade 11 state assessment. And again, we're gonna look at all students, but these are proficiency tests. These are, did students meet benchmarks? So looking at the park data, um, I added a column this year. I, this, these are district grade levels. So we test third, fourth through third through eighth. And what I gave you is all of the states that use the park assessment, then what Illinois' percentage was, and then how did 201U students do. What you'll notice here is that the all park states is pretty much their scores are in the low to mid 40s in terms of percents of students uh, meeting benchmarks. When you get to the Illinois scores, those scores are in the mid to upper 30s, topping out at 40% for seventh grade. 
And then when you look at 201U, our scores range from the mid-20s to the mid-30s. And the odd thing about the data from this year is that um, the even the odd numbered grades scored higher than the even numbered grades. It's just kind of a little quirky thing I, I noticed. But um, what you will see throughout all of this is that third grade students score higher than the rest of the grades. So you can see kind of how that how that lays out for reading. Um, when you get to math, what you will see is um, again math scores across the board are lower than reading. Uh, park states are predominantly in the 30s, with an outlier at the in third grade in the 40s, and again, eighth grade in the 20s. Um, the state of Illinois is in the low to mid 30s, uh, with a few that are in the upper 20s. And then when you get to 201U, again, you'll see that third grade had the highest score. Most of our scores are in the teens, and sixth grade had a really rough year with their math scores, um, which I'll have some more math data later on that we'll kind of reference back to this. Uh, the next thing I looked at was grade levels by schools. Um, as you know, back on this slide, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, that's the middle school, so there are no school reports for 6th through 8th grade. But when we get to K-5 uh, schools, we'll look at 3, 4, 5 by school. Again, what you'll see are the all park states to the left, the Illinois scores um, in the next highlighted column, and then our, our five elementary schools. Um, what I noticed here is that in this area here for third grade, again, remember our third grade scores nationwide seem to be higher. Um, we had three schools that were at or above the state and the park states. Um, and then in fourth and fifth grade, we had um, three areas where we were approaching the state average, but still slightly below. And then when you go to math, the same type of thing. You can see, again, the, the park states, the state of Illinois, and then how our schools did across those grade levels. Again, third grade is the higher performing grade, um, and we had two schools that were at or slightly above the state average. The next piece to this is something that was new for us last year. Um, we have an assessment um, warehouse that does a lot of statistical analysis on our data. And one of the things they provided for us last year was a projection on how our students would do on these assessments. So last fall, they were able to project how students would perform on the spring tests. And then what we got in the summer was we got a report that actually said, okay, here's what we projected, here's how students actually did. Did students meet the projection, exceed the projection, Were they did they not meet the projection? So again, looking at reading um, and math by district grade level, you can see which grade levels met, exceeded, or did not meet the projections. Um, the you know sixth grade math, we saw that low score there, and again, they did not meet projection. Um, fourth grade didn't meet in either one, but we had a lot of places where our grade levels exceeded the projections and especially we had four in math. So even though the scores look low, the projection, they actually exceeded projections. And then when you go and again, you look at the schools, how did the schools do overall with those projection results? Um, we had you know, three schools in reading that exceeded the projection. We had one that met and two that didn't in reading. And in math, um, we had three that exceeded projections in math and three that met. And if you look across um, Talala, you know, they had, ex they had exceeded in both areas. So they, um, they did some, some quality work there. Uh, this slide is for our high school. Um, we gave uh, three tests last year, um, both fall and spring. And in ninth grade, they took the PSAT 8-9. In 10th grade, the PSAT 10. And then 11th grade is the state assessment, which is the SAT. And I did exactly the same thing. I did the, the national, so how did all students do nationwide that took that um, assessment? How, what was the state's performance level on that assessment? And then how did our students do? Um, you can see that the state and the national percentages are very close. Um, our reading scores or English language arts are slightly below the state level. Um, math, there's a more significant difference between how our students did um, versus the state and the nation. 
And then the other thing that they do with College Board is they, they give you a, a piece of data on how many students actually met in both English language arts and math. And you'll see that to the right. Um, so you can see that, again, that, that percentage goes down, um, but our percentage of students that met at all three grades um, is lower than both the state and the nation. Um, just a, a, something to consider here as we do this, the College Board has a definition of proficiency. And their benchmark score tells us, their definition is that students who meet their scores have a 75% chance of earning a grade of C or better as a college freshman in a credit bearing course. When we get to the re school report card presentation, Illinois has changed those benchmark scores. They are not the college board scores. So as part of what Illinois has done in their assessment system, they actually have different uh, benchmark scores which are actually higher than college board. So we're gonna see some of those percentages change in November when we get the uh, reports. And then um, the next one, now we don't have a projection for high school because the test is too new. You know, we switched to the SAT series of tests a couple of years ago, so they have not yet developed a statistical model to give us those projections. So what I looked at here was what were our scores or our percents in the fall and how did those uh, percentages change in the spring? And if you look here in the ninth grade, um, for the fall to the spring, we had a 3% gain from fall to spring in all three areas. Um, 10th grade was the most impressive. They had seven to 10 percentage points, uh, percentage point gains from fall to spring, which is really different for us because under when we used to give the, F, the ACT, our, not, our 10th graders would be relatively flat in their scores, but they had some nice strong gains. And then our 11th grade pretty much had a plus or minus 1% from fall to um, spring. The next piece of this is what we call our local growth model. It is uh, designed by um, ECRA. And what they do is they look at, <clears throat> they have a statistical way of determining how students should perform compared to students who perform along the same way. So it's a, it's a statistical way of saying, Based on your past performance, here's how you should perform and here's how much you should grow. And this model is based on the, you know, the traditional stoplight. So um, if it's red, if you see a color red, um, it means that we got unsatisfactory growth. We've never had any red show up on our, in our data. Um, yellow means we had lower than expected growth. Green means our students achieved expected growth. And blue means they had higher than expected growth. So when we looked at our grade levels um, for reading and we test, we did kindergarten through eighth, so it's not just about those that take the state assessment, it's about all of our standardized assessments. <clears throat> you can see that all of our grade levels made expected growth, except for seventh grade, which had higher than expected growth. And then when we look at the high school, those gains that you saw um, were expected gains based on this growth model. And I, one thing I want to mention is these are the growth models based on students who have been here and have established an assessment history. So new students, unlike the park data when we looked at all students, this is really looking at students who have been with us long enough, at least a year, to establish some kind of assessment history. Um, so again, at the high school, we had expected growth for all three grade levels in English language arts. Um, when we get to math, we see again, mostly expected growth, but our seventh grade and our first grade had higher than expected growth in math. And then again, for math for the high school, the growth was expected. Uh, when we look at schools, overall growth for schools, again, in uh, reading, every school made expected growth according to the model, and the same thing with math. So even though we had what appeared to be really low math scores, and especially in a couple of areas, the growth that those students showed individually when they calculated it mathematically came out to be expected growth. So I, I, you know, if, I, if you go back to the slide where I had the proficiency versus growth, one of the things that we're focused on is you know, we have to increase proficiency, and the way that we do it, especially under the new model, is by 
getting higher than expected growth. So we're, we want to grow blue on these charts. We want to see more blue on the charts. And so to do that, um, some of the things that we're doing around the, um, the idea of growth and test score gains is not only are we looking at our local growth model based on what I showed you, which is overall, but we're able in this model to target um, groups and programs that we have so that we can track those students throughout the year. So we can look at any programs that we have or any interventions we're doing and monitor those students in terms of the growth model after each assessment period that we have. So we can look at them in the fall, we can look at them in the winter, and we can look at them again in the spring. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're really trying to make really good use of the assessment data that we get from Park and ISBE and College Board for curricular changes and instructional decision making. They have given us just a, a wealth of information and resources that we can use to actually not only do test prep, but also embed um, the strategies and the types of questions into our day-to-day -day instruction. So our teams are looking at those every year um, to incorporate those things. The, second, the next one is that we now have a lot of software programs to meet individual learning needs and reading and math. So technology is our friend. It allows us to give students an opportunity both at school and at home to focus on what it is that they need um, to improve their scores. We are also able to expand after school programming uh, through our Title I grant. Um, we now have every school classified as Title I and we're using funds there to make sure that all schools now have after school programs. And then a few more, um, we're focused on instructional technology this year. We're one-to-one -one, um, in all of our buildings. We've added intervention support personnel at CSK and Moni. Um, we did adopt this year a new math series for K-5, which is a highly rated common core <clears throat> math series. Um, all of our schools have intervention periods, whether it's for intervention or enrichment built into their day. We're into our second year of HERO at the high school. Um, this year they have added targeted tutoring so they can identify students and provide tutoring during that 25 minute block. The middle school now is having their ramp period due to their schedule change. They can now have ramp twice a week. Um, and then all of our other buildings are working on their blocks and using their data to form student groups. And then the last thing is a district focus on um, creating a good environment for learning through PBIS and restorative practices. The last thing that I wanted to talk about, again, is something new for this year. It's our Kindergarten Individual Development Survey, or as it's referred to as KIDS. And what KIDS does is it measures kindergarten readiness. So are the students coming into us in kindergarten, are they ready for kindergarten? Um, it was new last fall, and what, we're, what our kindergarten teachers do is they collect data during the first 40 days of school, and they report that data through the kids system on a learning continuum that talks about kindergarten readiness. And then they look at these 14 measures basically in three categories, social emotional learning, language and literacy development, and math. So how are students coming to us in kindergarten? How are they ready to learn? Um, this is not something that is based on whether our schools have done, our K-5 schools have done a good job. This is based on how are we receiving the students that we get, where are they at? So um, this data came out in August and we have the three areas. Um, we have the state averages and we also have our district averages. And you can see in the um, social emotional area, we're a little below the state. Um, language and literacy development, we're right there with the state. And um, I think this one, remember I said I was gonna come back to the math. This one really jumps out at us. Um, it's lower statewide, but the gap between 201 U incoming kindergartners and what the state averages, there's a 12 point differential there. Um, so they come in not ready for math and I think we're seeing some of that work its way through the system. Um, the other piece of data that they provided us is looking at the number of developmental areas that students have readiness in. So we're looking at are there students that are not ready in, in any area? So the zero developmental areas, do they have one area of readiness, two areas, or are they ready in all three? And what you'll notice here 
is that both the state and our district, we really have about 40 to 45% of our students coming into kindergarten that have no readiness areas developed. Um, that's that's a, la a large number of students. And the other one over here that on the other end of the spectrum is what percent of students come having readiness in all three areas? And you can see the state drops to 24%, but we have a dramatic decrease down to 10% of our students. Um, the next piece of data that they gave us was based on income. So again, the students who are not uh, classified as low income versus low income students. And what you'll see here is that that percentage again uh, in all three areas goes from 10% down to about 8%. Um, so we're having students coming in that are you know, definitely not ready for kindergarten. Um, this actually, again, it's a new piece of data, um, but it created quite a, a stir, I think. Um, I don't know if anybody else saw this, but the morning after this came out on the news, I was watching the news as I was getting ready to go to work, and Channel 7 had, had a report on it right away. Um, it, there are several news articles. It even went national. Um, U.S. News had an article that came through the Associated Press about Illinois students not being ready for kindergarten. And, and all the articles I read really talked about we need to put more money into early childhood education and the fact that we have no, um, we have varying different uh, definitions of what quality is in an early childhood program. And early childhood can be anything from daycare to state funded programs that you see in school districts to, you know, somebody working at home with your student. But because there's such a wide variety what they're talking about is that the state needs to put a stronger effort into developing programs that are available for students from birth to five. So tonight, what we wanted to do, because we have um, an early childhood program that just got a, a gold quality award, we asked our EC director to come and talk to you a little bit about her program. Um, and also we asked one of our kindergarten teachers to come tonight um, to tell you a little bit, to just kind of give a, 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 a kind of a, you know, here are the people that are working with our students every day. What are they seeing when you look at this data? What is it that they're experiencing in programs and classrooms? So with that, Kelly, I'm going to turn it over to you. I don't know if you want my, that mic? You want to grab that one? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Cheston, the director for the Crete Moni Early Learning Center. I am going on my 24th year in the district, and I have grown up in the community. I've gone through the public or, or Crete Moni School District as well. Um, but I want to introduce my my coworker, Tammy Winter. She is one of the teachers at Early Learning Center, and of course, Gretchen Quirk. She is a kindergarten teacher at Moni. So I'm happy to have them both here with us. Okay, so the Early Learning Center, um, this is our staff and our, our program in general. We have a lot of therapists on hand. Um, we have 10 classrooms. Um, we have specials. We have, we have our, our community liaison this year. So a lot of important things in place. Our, our program, our Preschool for All grant has been in existence since 1985. And of, of course, we're still going strong and it's grown tremendously. We can hold up to 250 students. 140 of them are the preschool for all, and 110 are our special education students. We have instructional early childhood classrooms. I have three teachers teaching them. There are six half-day sessions. There's a teacher, two assistants, and a possible, possibility of a one-on-one -on -one depending on the need of the students. It serves up to 10 students. Um, busing is provided for these classes. We have blended early childhood class, classes. There's three teachers teaching that. Six half-day sections. It's a teacher and a classroom assistant. Um, this is a general education classroom, but it is um, supported by a, a special education teacher. So all those strategies, important things are in place. The class holds up to 15 students. There's five students with IEPs, individualized education plans, and 10 students that are, are at risk in that classroom. Busing is only provided for our special education students at this time. 
We have two straight pre-K classrooms that hold up to 20 students. There's four sections of those. It's a teacher and a classroom assistant. Um, it's a, again, it's a general education classroom. Busing is not provided for this classroom. I have two all-day programs. These are special intensified programs. It's called EC Smile and K1 Smile. It's sensory motor integrated with language learning environment. Now these programs are put into place um, for these students that need that spec specified one-on-one -on -one attention to help them learn those skills to get them ready for our other classes. So it's a long intensified um, program. And again, we it was such a success that we built on to the K-1. Um, they, there's a teacher and four classroom assistants in our EC Smile classroom, and they can hold up to 10 students. And then our K-1 program right now, there is a teacher and three assistants, but as more students come in that need those one-on-one -on -one services, that may grow to four assistants as well. There is busing for both of these classes. Um, parent education is provided. Um, the goal of these classes is to get the students what they need and get them into our other programs. So program entry. How do you get in the program, might you ask? Well, every child coming in has to be screened. We have five screenings throughout the year. We have them in August, October, November, February, and May. Um, sometimes they're two days each, depending on how many students we need to screen. Uh, and if the students need further testing, we do have di uh, diagnostic testing available after each of these screenings. There's another way to get in, early intervention. We work very closely with our early intervention programs and the students in our district that are turning age three, um, we, we work before, they meet me before they turn age three. So when they're two years, nine months, we have a transition meeting. They come to our school and it's a process where they learn about our, our program. They learn about the type of process and how to get into our programming. The next meeting is a domain meeting. That's when they meet with me individually and the parent and I will talk about each of the areas um, of concern and that's where they sign off on the evaluation process. The, the next meeting is the early intervention intake meeting. That's our final meeting to get them into our program. It's our eligibility meeting. So our entire team is there. We go through the reports. We talk about what they qualify for and what type of programming our, our kiddos need. Last way of entering a program is the students that transfer in. Now, this, these are students that had to have had a prior programming for Preschool for All or have an individualized education plan. And if that's the process, we, we transfer them right into the programming. If they haven't had that part of the evaluation, we send them through our preschool screening. So again, it, it's mandatory that every student coming into our program is screened. What do we see? Over the many years that I've been here, um, we've seen the change in the students. There's several risk factors that are examined to get our students in here. Um, we're seeing a greater need in all the risk areas, especially in the social emotional piece. Um, there's a great, greater need for parent education and a greater need for parent resources. So on that note, I'm gonna pass this over to Gretchen. Hi, thanks, Kelly. Um, so I did collaborate with um, kindergarten teachers throughout our teachers throughout. More incoming students are coming with no exposure to school readiness skills. Um, students, their their experiences vary. So are they coming from a daycare experience, um, or is their preschool experience more play based, or is it more academic focused? So obviously, all of those things contribute to how these little, I call them babies, are coming to us. Um, students with Academic preschool experience obviously are coming to us better prepared. Um, and then students whose home experience, support readiness, development are also better prepared. Um, it kind of speaks for itself. Um, the next slide. Um, so I was asked to come up with a kindergarten expectation list. And certainly we don't expect anything. We know that kids are coming from a variety of of experiences, so this is more of a wish list, um, how, we would, how we would like them to come to us. Um, if they are able to follow a two-step direction, um, if they can recognize, it's wonderful, if they can recognize their name, if they can write it, it's 
much better. Um, if they can recognize some letters and sounds, if they just have some experience um, with knowing letters and you know what the letter B is and maybe what sound that it makes. Um, if they can recognize some of those numbers, zero through 10, if they can attempt to write some letters. Um, one of the biggest hurdles to get over in the first few uh, weeks, months of kindergarten is I can't. They don't have the confidence to even try. And so I'm like, you're right, you can't unless you try. You have to try. Try your best. And they're like, I tried my best. I'm like, great job. That's all you have to do. You just have to try. So can they attempt to write those letters? Can they use scissors? That's a tricky one. Um, and then can they just sit in a group as we you know, or gather on the rug? Can they sit and listen? So that can be tricky too. Okay, so it's very important to us that we bridge that gap and we find out what they're needing as they, they go on to kindergarten. Um, our program is doing great. We have, um, like, I, like you heard earlier, we're the, a high quality gold program school, um, which means that when they came to evaluate us, um, we had all the qualities that they were looking for. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely. And that's what we're looking towards for our future. Um, what can we do to help our families? Well, absolutely, adding onto our pro program, expanding it, getting a larger facility. So in, in, if, we, if we lead towards that, the larger facility, things that we can add on are birth to three type program, meaning that's more, more education for our parents activities with parents, home visits. We're talking about not having them leave their babies with them with us all day, but working with those families. That's the Prevention Initiative Grant. The state has that grant out there. It'll be available in five years, so that's something that we will write towards if this is what our community is looking for and wants. But as, as we stated earlier, um, there is that need for that parent education, um, helping and resources and working with them. Um, going on, another, another expansion act, um, program that we can add to our, our program would be the preschool expansion grant. Another grant that's out there that will be available in five years. It's a full day preschool program for four year olds in high need communities. So we're collecting data now. We want to know what does our community want? Do they need that full day program? Um, do they need transportation? If you're not in our half day program, why not? So I'm, we're collecting throughout this school year. Hopefully we'll get some good data, but I think that this is something that would help our community as well, having these opportunities for our little ones, especially to help make that transition to kindergarten a little smoother. And of course, I had to throw that up there, transportation for all. Um, that's another thing. Our, our families are always in need of transportation. You never know when that car may break down or um, they can't, that there's someone sick and they can't get them here. If we have the transportation, you know, it's a given and consistent that we can get our kiddos in school. So it's always, that's a wish list, of course, um, and something that can help our, our program grow. So I just want to thank all of you for your time and patience through this. And um, board, do we sure. have any questions? We'll be happy to take questions. Mm -hmm. Or we can. Thank Go you. head back up. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Laura, anything else? That's it? Okay. All right, I have some thank yous. To Deborah Rogers Parker from Erin Lane. The students and staff of Crete Elementary School would like to express our heartfelt gratitude for your recent generous donation of school supplies. 
Thank you for recognizing that we have many students that need assistance and they will certainly benefit from your kindness. As we begin another great school year, we want you to know how much we appreciate the partnership and continued support that we receive from Holland Company. From Nicole Persick, social worker at Crete Elementary, to the members of the Crete Women's Club. Thank you for the generous donation of school supplies, book bags, and towels that you provided to Crete Elementary. The items you donated were provided to some of our families who were in need and will be used throughout the year to support students who may require additional supplies. Your thoughtfulness is greatly appreciated by all the members of our school community. Also to Ms. Deborah Rogers from Holland Company from Bryan, Maine. I want to reach out to you and thank you for the generous donation of school supplies to be used for the students of Coretta Scott King Magnet School. Our social worker will strive to ensure that the supplies will be distributed throughout our school and any additional supplies will be stored for classroom teachers to provide should they see a need in their classroom. Your assistance of your company has enabled the school district to accomplish far more than it otherwise could have. On behalf of the students, faculty, staff, and parents of Coretta Scott King Magnet School, please accept our deepest gratitude for your generous donation. From Jontel Perkins to Miss April Heidi Krasik, I would like to thank you for the back to school treats you provided the Balmoral teachers and the staff of the school year. Additionally, we would like to express our appreciation for the book, to book talks you provide for our classrooms. The scholars are always engaged and are eager to read many of the books you introduce them to. After all, the most important way a child develops as a reader is by reading, and that will only happen if they can find books that interest them. The book talks are also a great way to strengthen the library's relationship with our students. We are grateful your, for your contribute, continued support. From Erin Lane to the Crete Elementary friend, a dear friend of Crete Elementary, once again, we thank you for your extremely generous monetary gift to Crete Elementary. Our teachers will be very excited to receive your gift for classroom purchases. Please know that you're appreciated very much and Crete Elementary is very fortunate to have you as a supportive friend. I think we should probably go back to the way we used to do this, Terry, maybe have them printed out so that we can share and I'm not reading all of them. Can we do that next month if there's thank yous? Printed, it's easier. One, yeah, once and then the different board members can read them. Thank you. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Excuse me. Before we do that, can I can I have a motion to remove the overnight field trips from the consent so we don't have to go back and alter the consent? I don't think we need. We don't need a motion. Do we? Okay. okay. Yes. Can I get a motion to? Remove the it's three. both of them, C1 and 2. Yes. It's the uh, one we have. Yeah. Mr. Brown, C1 and 2? Yes. Both. Yes. Can I get a motion to remove items C1 and 2 from the consent agenda to be voted on separately? It's 8, C1 and 2. Mm -hmm. 8, C1 and 2. Yep. Curriculum. Approve the CMHS Overnight Theater Festival trip and approved CMHS Overnight Band Tour Clinic trip. Mm -hmm. Good. Yep. 8C, 1 and 2. I'll tell you. So, Brian, do you have a page on there? Are you right? What page is that? Um. 220, 222, 223. That's what's showing up. 
Terry is having a difficult time hearing us with the fans, so if board members could please talk into their mic, please. We're looking for the page number. 220, yes, 224, 225, 224, 223, 224. Okay. One is the form, one is the... Let's see. Okay, can I get a motion? Mm -hmm. Can I get a second? Second. Roll call. Mr. Ture? Nay. Mrs. Ruth? Nay. Dr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mr. Albrecht? Aye. Mrs. Galbraith is an aye. Mrs. Gasparo? Aye. Motion carries. We will do the consent agenda first and then we will come back to that. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Dr. Cognonis. Okay. All right, number one, regular meeting minutes of August 21st, 2018. Number two, regular meeting closed session minutes of August 21st, 2018. Item three, committee of the whole meeting minutes of September 11th, 2018. And item four, Committee of the Whole Closed Session Minutes of September 11th, 2018. Business as well. Okay. Uh, business item B, one, approval of payroll for August 2018. Item two, approve accounts payable. Item three, approve treasurer's report. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Mrs. Gasparro, can I just make a comment on the bills, please? The agenda, um, the agenda of bills. On page 99 of the agenda of bills, I think on your book report, I'm, I'm sorry, on your board book, page 99, there's a duplicate payment to Chicago Christian. Uh, one is being deleted. Um, oh, I'm sorry, hold on. I think that one is for the wrong fiscal year has been noted on that, so we made that correction in the system. Let me just go back to that one and make sure of that. There is a note on it. Right, so that has been changed to 1819, so just so, I just wanna make people aware of that. And then the other one is, um, there is, uh, I believe it's on page 106 of the board book, there's a duplicate payment to Jennifer Dugan uh, that is on there in error. We've deleted the one. So there's only one payment for 138.32. There's an additional one on page 101. Can you clarify? Page, page 101? 101. One second, commercial please. electronic systems. It says budgeted and paid out of 1718. So is that in the error? No, that is that is correct. That is paid out of 1718. It's going to be accrued back. The auditors get that and they will accrue that back to 1718. The project was started in 1718 uh, at the end of uh, the school year and it completed prior to July 1. Okay. So that's that's correct. Any other questions? Roll call, please. Mr. Albrecht? Aye. Mr. Brown? Nay. Dr. Hall? Nay. Mrs. Rube? Aye. Mr. Ture? Aye. Mrs. Galbraith is an aye. Mrs. Gasparo? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, we will go back to the theater and band field trips. Mr. Brown, before I make a motion, did you have questions? No. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the CMHS Overnight Theater Festival trip? So moved. Second. Any discussion? 
Roll call. Mr. Albrecht? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Dr. Hall? Aye. Mrs. Rube? Aye. Mr. Ture? Aye. Mrs. Galbraith is an aye. Mrs. Gasparo? Abstain. Can I get a motion to approve the CMHS Overnight Band Tour Clinic Trip? Moved. Second. Any questions? Roll call. Mr. Trey? Aye. Mrs. Roop? Aye. Dr. Hall? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Mr. Albrecht? Aye. Mrs. Galbraith is an aye. Mrs. Gasparo? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Action reports. Curriculum. Laura, did you want to say anything before I make ask for a motion? No? Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the amendment to the District Title I plan? So moved. Second. Okay. Comments or questions? Did Nelson first it or second it? I can't I, tell their voices. I, I moved to race second. I know it's hard with the Sorry. fan going. No other comments or questions? Okay, roll call. Mr. Albrecht? Aye. Mr. Brown? Aye. Dr. Hall? Aye. Mrs. Roop? Aye. Mr. Ture? Aye. Mrs. Galbraith is an aye. Mrs. Gasparo? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Can I get a motion to approve the employment of certified staff, the reassignment of certified staff, the leave of absence for certified staff, the return from leave of absence for certified staff, the resignation of certified staff, the employment of educational support staff, the reassignment of educational support staff, the leave of absence for educational support staff, the return from leave of absence of educational support staff, the resignation of educational support staff, and the dismissal of educational support staff. Moved. Who was that? Cheryl? Second. Okay. Mr. Neal. Good evening. Good evening. Personnel report reads as follows. For certified staff employment, Keenan Keller. Certified staff reassignment, Guadalupe Martinez. Certified staff resignation, Deborah Collier and Joanne Forstall. Certified staff leave of absence, Salvador Aguilar, Andy Juarez Colbert. Certified staff return from leave of absence, Megan Costa, Carrie Dragovich, Evan Lukowski, and Michelle Kelly. Educational support staff employment, Letitia Balnius, Lola Cole, Amy Gilliam, Brittany Jett, Tracy, Tracy Swinford. Educational support staff leave of absence, Gunther Bauman, both for a leave of absence and then following that with an intermediate leave of absence, Anthony Dina III, and Genevieve Robinson. Educational support staff return from leave of absence, Morgan Pfeiffer and Jennifer Pratt. Educational support staff reassignment, Kelly Gillott, Kelsey Lucas, Rosalina Zamora de Acosta. Educational support staff resignation, Ashley Brown, Diane Cook, Kathy DeVries, Kelly Hallberg, Nicole Hill, Yvonne Nash, and Joe Samuel Jr. Educational support staff dismissal, Clark Roberts and Thomas Webster. That ends the personnel report. Questions? Roll call. Mr. Ture? Aye. Mrs. Roop? Aye. Dr. Hall? Nay. Mr. Brown? Nay. Mr. Albrecht? Aye. Mrs. Galbraith is an aye. Mrs. Gasparo? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Oh, 
Okay, before I make a motion, Mr. Neal, do you want to talk about the ACME contract? Uh, just briefly, the ACME contract uh, is uh, expired at uh, the start of school for the 2018-19 school year. The negotiations for a successor agreement began in May of 2018 and concluded in August of 2018. Uh, negotiations were very amicable and uh, it actually not a whole lot needed to change in the contract. Uh, the new agreement is a four-year agreement that allows us to move forward and focus on issues facing the district without having to worry about labor negotiations for those four years. And so administration would recommend that the board ratify the contract this evening. Um, ACME, uh, the Association of Crete Money Employees, did act to ratify the agreement on August 20th, 2018. So the recommendation would be uh, that the Board of Education approve the 2018 to 2022 collective bargaining agreement between the Board of Education and the Association of Crete Money Employees as presented, subject to language cleanup by the administration and the association, which does not substantively alter the terms of the agreement. Can I get a motion to approve the ACME union contract? Move. Second. Okay, again, was that? Uh, Trey, Trey, Trey and Albrecht. Sorry, I can't get their voices. Questions, comments? I have a couple of questions. Can you clarify again the increase being offered, the percentage? Do I'm sorry, Dr. Hall, I can't The hear percentage you. of the increase? The increases uh, in the contract are 3% per year for each of the four years, including uh, beginning with this year. And if for this year would be retroactive to the beginning of the contract year. And we had uh, discussions regarding this, um, the uniform issue with the district wanting to provide 11 sets of uniforms as well as cleaning all of those. And this was an increase in what was budgeted, correct? Mr. Sarma went from, was it 19? I can't hear. There's a, there's a budget right now of $19,000 to purchase uniforms uh -huh. that we purchase now. It would increase to approximately 43,000 43, with, with the uniform contract, yes. And is that language still in? I'm sorry? Is the language still in the contract that we would provide that? It is. If, if for any reason uh, that contract is not approved subsequent to this approval, uh, we simply have to put together a memorandum of understanding regarding that matter, which I've already spoken to ACME leadership will not be a problem. Also, is this posted right now for public to see? No, it cannot be posted until it's ratified. And I can't it's final. hear you. It, it is post, it's posted once it's ratified and final. Okay, so if it passes tonight, when are we posting? We, right. we can post it tomorrow. Okay. so the be clear that these contracts need to be posted on online. Absolutely, and they, they have been online. Uh, but these, currently the old contract is online because this one has not been ratified yet. Um, what was the average base salary increase, the base salary, not so much the year on end, year on end, year on end increase, but the base salaries on average? Did we jack the base up a little bit? Uh, some, most of the base salaries did increase uh, to keep up with, uh, with the marketplace in the area. Uh, some did not because they were at the market value at this time. So uh, I would say, I don't know, Mr. Sermo, we had about two or three that did not increase as far as the, the beginning salary, right. but yes. the rest did go up uh, some amount to reflect uh, the, labor market and yes so most of most of them did increase um you know we we looked at it um lyle and i and, and there was a study done that lyle had done um a while ago um looking at starting salaries in the area and that of those um those jobs um and so we upped some of them from a starting salary wise uh but some of them kind of stayed the same just because they were already at market value did we ever share that study with the board i don't know if i don't think we i don't know if we have shared it with no. the board i don't think so it was discussed in negotiations and right. we, we shared that information there okay can you at least tell me 
what was the potential highest increase, base increase percentage-wise, roughly? I don't know if I have that handy right now. I, I don't. I, yeah, I didn't bring an analysis of the starting salaries yeah. with me tonight, but um, probably the largest increase would have been in the custodial area. I think so. Um, which give me went a number. Up, uh, I can believe anyone, it went can, up two dollars. Any board member that was on the negotiating team, give me a number, uh, percentage wise. What was the highest base increase? We, we, I don't have the percentages. I just know what their starting pays are at now. I was not at the last negotiation session. I mean, I would think something like that would kind of stick in your head on something, you know, if we, we and again, I'm not looking and, and criticizing the pay increase. I just want to see just how far of a gap we were if we was trying to obtain market value to get our employees up to market value. And you say some did not need a base increase, but some did. Was some way out there, 25%? No below market value. They were, they were a dollar or two, if that. Like I said, I, I don't need the dollar amount, but just percentage wise. Well, as far as percentages, we didn't do it by percentages. So that's why they're not sticking in my head right now. We we looked at the the base salaries and the salary study for, uh, you know, South Cook and Will County and it, it both in elementary districts, high school districts, unit districts. Mm -hmm. And we uh, put that together and came up with the dollar amount that is roughly the average base salary in that survey. And so uh, that's where the salaries were set. Those are for new employees only. Existing employees will not be adjusted based on those base salaries. They're being adjusted by the percentage increase. Okay, that's my last question. With the administrators, the board looked at bringing our administrators up to market value over two or three years or whatever. So at this point, with our ACME uh, union employees, we were looking to bring those employees up to market value. Is that correct? I believe uh, in every category, they will be at the average market value uh, probably for 1920. So there, there will be two increases that will get them there. And the salaries are, you know, I can't speak to how fast they're going to go after this year, but contracts right now have been settling in this range. So to keep up, that's where we agreed to settle. But there's there's nobody being brought up to any, this, the starting pays are increasing. So anybody that's just coming to us, the, the base pay for somebody starting is increasing, correct? Correct. Well, let me retract. This is not my last question. This maybe is my last question. <laughs> are employees in the ACME union, are they at or are they, are they not at market value with this contract? With this contract, they will be at market value. Yes. Thank you. And just for clarity, uh, what Mr. Brown was speaking of, the administrative increases do we calculate what that percentage of increase, because I believe the majority of the board approved that. What was that percentage? I don't have that off the top of my head. I can, I can get that number for you, though, what that is. Yes. yes. Thank you. One, one question here. The salary increases, increases proposed in this contract, were they built into the budget that the board approved last month? They were built into the budget, yes. Okay. So those, Thank you. Those, those are in there. Any other questions? Roll call, please. Mr. Albrecht? Aye. Mr. Brown? Nay. Dr. Hall? Because I do not agree with some of the language in the contract, my vote is a nay. I'm sorry, I nay. didn't hear you. Nay. Thank you. Mrs. Root? Aye. Mr. Ture? Aye. Mrs. Galbraith is a present. Mrs. Gasparo? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. And just to add to that, I feel in the future, like we're now about to vote on this uniform contract, I think it would have been better to vote on that first. 
before voting on the actual contract. Because if the language is already in there and then it doesn't, it, and the vote fails, now we have to go back and change and all of that. So I feel that it's basically out of order. Okay. I can understand that. Okay. Mr. Sermo, approved uniform service contract. Thank you. This agenda item is uh, something we talked about in negotiations and that the ACME union had uh, brought up and requested. So um, looked into a uniform contract for our uh, employees um, in the security job, food service and custodian. And also we included the non-union individuals who are our maintenance personnel uh, in building and grounds. It does, uh, there is an estimated weekly cost of the service uh, of approximately $829.72 to provide uniforms to 85 employees, which is about $507.59 per employee per year. Um, you'll see in my report the category and also the type of clothing that they would be receiving. Uh, the contract does include pickup, delivery, inspection, repair, and replacement of uniforms in case they are torn or destroyed um, in any way and are, are not wearable anymore. The delivery and pickup would be to each location and to each building. Each employee would, in essence, have 11 sets of uniforms, and those are broken down with five are being cleaned, five they have in their locker for the week, and then one is being worn. All of the um, shirts that the employees will be wearing um, have a district logo on them uh, and an emblem identifying what area they are in along with their name. We do have the ability to stop the service during the summer months for those employees that do not work during the summer. So that will lower the cost a little bit. Um, Cintas is providing storage lockers for us. And again, as we talked a little bit earlier, uh, currently we budget $19,000 for the purchase of uniforms right now. Um, but the, the uh, staff member is responsible for the cleaning of those. Okay. Staff member is responsible for... I'm sorry? What did you say at the end? The staff member is responsible for... The staff members right now are responsible for the cleaning and laundering of, the, of their uniforms right now. Currently. Currently they are. Okay. Thank yes. you. Okay. And can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Questions or comments from the board? Well, you all have heard from me, but I'll say it again. Um, I think this is out, an outlandish expense that we're taking on. As I've stated before, people are responsible for cleaning their own uniforms. It, to me, it's a luxury service to purchase 11 uniforms, and I understand the breakdown, but I think that's designed to make money off of the district. Um, I just think this is way over the top. Everybody, you know, you get a job. Like I said, I could even understand maybe issuing, you know, a couple of uniforms, but 11 uniforms and cleaning them, that's a luxury service in my eyes. We, we, we get a job. It's our responsibility to purchase appropriate clothing. I understand some people might get a job and they get a, a, a clothing allowance, but those are usually, you know, jobs where, you know, they're paying tons and tons and tons of money. I just think that this is a waste and we need to be more responsible with, with our tax dollars, especially considering what we've been up against in regards to how we're spending money and proposing $84 million facility plans. Yeah, and I, I, can, I concur somewhat with what Dr. Hall said. Uh, you know, it, it, <clears throat> it makes me feel proud to see our employees looking nice in uniforms. However, I think this is an overkill. I think the money could have been better spent even giving them more of a raise or salary increase. And I heard mentioned in our community as a whole that we want our employees to look nice, like 
government employees, so on and so forth. And I think the buck stop here is the board. The board themselves, including me, really doesn't reflect a business appropriateness attire coming up here to the board. So if we expect our employees to look good in their jobs and their duties, I think it should start at the board. So when we can get our act together here, here then I can say expending more money to make our employees look better. But until then, I don't agree with the amount. And as you know, Dr. Hall, I agreed with you wholeheartedly when we had this discussion. My husband wore a uniform for 31 years, and I cleaned that uniform for 31 years. I don't have a problem with providing some uniforms for them, but we need to not be paying to clean them. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. I did it. Everybody else can do it. And I'll also add, I did ask... Um, our director of food service and our uh, maintenance director, if they've had any issues with employees coming in with issues with cleaning, you know, with their clothing being cleaned or anything like that. And they did state that, no, there weren't any major issues, you know, some things here and there, but, you know, to me that, that speaks to the fact that there's really no reason for us to, to do this. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, I'd just like to say, I mean, I think our employees work very hard for the district. This is a nice perk. And while I ordinarily wouldn't support something that's above budget, this is one time I will. I have a question for you too. Ken, I have a question. The 19 grand that we've got in the budget now for uniforms, uh, how is that proportioned? Uh, what do we do? Uh, do the, does the new employee get X sets of uniforms as they come in and as uniforms are are uh, tattered or torn or whatever, they come to you and or through their service director and ask for a new set? And is that money at that time allocated for them to purchase one? Yeah, the money, the money is allocated between the three different areas, security, uh, custodial maintenance, and then also food service, so it's up to them and how they disperse that money and, and um, what type of apparel uh, they provide to their employees, um, along with how many they give to each of their employees, too. Um, they do have the money there that if an employee does, um, you know, tear their uniform or something like that, they're able to get um, additional additional apparel items in that. So, so that the at the section level or service chief level, whatever director level, they they can go out and purchase replacements. Right, it's at the it's at the director level. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Roll call, please. Mr. Albrecht. Aye. Mr. Brown. Nay. Dr. Hall. Nay. Mrs. Root? Nay. Mr. Ture? Nay. Mrs. Galbraith is a nay. Mrs. Gasparro? Nay. Motion fails. Uh, can, can do you have anything to say on the next one before we ask for a motion? Pardon me? Do you have anything to say before we ask for a motion? Um, I can. I don't, I don't know if you want the motion first, but I can In case go through. motion it. changes, yeah. Okay, sure. Um, this is the approval of the settlement agreement between Chicago Heights Construction and uh, Creek Money School District regarding the middle school addition and remodeling project. If you recall at the last meeting, the board approved the terms and conditions of that agreement. Now comes before you the actual agreement to be approved. As part of this agreement and the terms that were agreed upon at the last meeting, um, there will be a lump sum payment for the remainder of $716,842.53 within 30 days um, if the agreement is approved. There is a, uh, the, we have taken out the termination date uh, of March 2nd for cause and changed the termination for convenience. Declaration of substantial completion to, so that Chicago Heights Construction can provide full waivers, releases, warranties, manuals, and as-built drawings. There's a mutual waiver of release for all claims, demands, and causes of action. There is the standard confidentiality provisions that are included in here. 
Um, and there is also a clause for no admission of wrongdoing by either party. What you will see is the financial impact of this is that uh, the full settlement agreement, which includes the approximate $308,000 payment that was made plus the $700,000 payment comes to $1.25 million. The district does um, get liquidated damages in the amount of $135,000, which is the maximum according to the contract. And also there's an amount credited for unfinished items uh, for $23,835.06, which means that uh, the district has recovered $158,835.06. Can I get a motion to approve the settlement agreement between Chicago Heights Construction and Crete Money School District 201U regarding the middle school addition and remodeling project? Moved. I'll second it. Who was that, Cheryl? Cheryl. Okay. Questions or comments from the board? Well, you know how I feel about this. I share my piece with this. I just totally think Chicago Heights Construction Company got away with murder. And I do value, I know it sounds somewhat of an oxymoron or, or uh, irony, so to speak, when we, I say our, our lawyer, I value his input and in how he drafted up the agreement. But nonetheless, I just think this is mm -hmm. not something that we are ought, ought to embark upon. That's my feeling. And I'm sorry, Mr. Brown, I, I'm having a very difficult time hearing. Can you read? Well, basically, I just do not agree with this. That's all. I just said I shared my piece before with, with the contract and what we agreed upon with Chicago Heights Construction Company. And in a nutshell, I just think that we let them escape too easy. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question on the on the as built and all that. You said March. Uh, if we settle this before March and give them their money, what teeth do we have to make sure that they enforce that we get all the as built and all the manuals, et cetera? How do we guarantee that? And what is the what is the recourse if come March we don't have all the information we're supposed to have? Uh, what have our attorneys said about that? Well, I, I will share this, that I'll, I'll be talking to our lawyer, that, whose handle is Ray Hauser, uh, to make sure there's an equal exchange of payments and as built and warranties and operational manuals and all of that. So uh, before payment is given over to them of the $700,000, uh, the terms and conditions that are in here is they need to supply those as built um, along with operation manuals and all of that stuff. So. Um, it'll be exchanged at the table. So when I pass the check, they'll give us that stuff. If they don't give us that stuff, they're not getting the check. So so if I understand it right, then this payment can be delayed up until March? And No, the payment the payment has to be made within 30 days. Uh, the approval, if the, if the agreement is approved, the payment will be made within 30 days. Uh, but again, however, payment won't be made if they have not met their terms of the of the agreement which is handing over all those things so so what what is the march date it's just that i don't know what that is it says rescission of the termination dated march 2 oh i'm sorry so the march yeah the mar the march date was a Last when we year. terminated their contract we sent them notice and terminated their contract in march that date will still stand However, it's going to be changed from, uh, let me just look at that real quick. It'll be changed from termination for cause to termination for convenience. Okay. And I think right. this is one of the things that Mr. Brown was talking about, to be honest with you. That was March yes. of this year. March is, okay. I, I was confused with what yes, you said. I thought they had like four or five months to, right. or, or long, you know, to uh, hand us over the stuff without any enforcement. Uh, the other thing is, if if we if we vote this down and go to court, the contract is was explained to me is the best we can get out of this is 135 grand. 
is and we're getting 135 grand is that is that what what else can we get out of this if we say no sure we sue them can uh, and and what would the an estimate on legal costs be right so according to the contract again this is from ray hauser according to that contract the maximum liquidated damages that we could receive is one hundred thirty five thousand dollars so we've maxed that out the second part of that then becomes, okay, what work was not completed according to the contract? And again, that is what um, is in discussion and would, could go to court. Um, and so when you do that, um, it's one side saying one thing, it's another side saying another thing was, you know, things like, were the, was it part of the contract or is it really warranty work? That's not part of the contract, you know? Um, so that's where you fight and that's where the legal costs will come in and they really could add up to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars depending on how it's stretched out okay thank you and now the other thing I, and let me also say this mr. trade too is that um, we've I've talked to DLA architects and they can't give me a clear answer to what is done and what hasn't been done quite honestly on that so the whole, the whole thing's a mess. It is. It really is. And I think, uh, again, I'll, I'll refer back to, you know, what Mr. Brown has said, and, and that's the difficulty with this thing. And, and you know, that's the tough part of it. Uh, but, again, do you, you put the resources into the lawyer's pockets, or do we just settle this and, and move forward? Thank you. So if this isn't approved, we're going to go to court. I'm sorry, say that again? If this is not approved, we will have to go to court? Probably. They will probably sue us, yes. Well, just one more question. I believe this is still part of the conversation. The open action item that was that we took on, were, and it was $23,000 roughly that we mm -hmm. estimated to complete the open action items. Did we ever get an update on that? Where are we with that? Um, Keith and I can work on that and get that. I know. I know one of the things that you had mentioned too, Mr. Brown, was the sign for the, the front. sign. Yes, um, that has been installed. It has. Uh, yes, it has. Uh, in fact, it's on the uh, agenda bills ah, now. Okay. So that's been taken care of. We did the ah. same thing. We saved a little bit of money. It only cost us about seventeen thousand because we did it in conjunction with updating the high school sign also at the same time. That needed some new Okay, so how much have we expended so far for the sign and whatever you bundle with? The sign was about 17,000, I do know that. So um, we have 6,000 left. To well, and, and the again, um, I'll take a look at that. And I, again, see, I don't have that up top. See, that's, yet, what I, well, that. that's what I was afraid of. Sure. You know, we wasn't clear. We estimated $23,000 to finish the open action items. and. You know, we already expended seventeen thousand, I think, and I don't know exactly and, how many open items we have. Right. Can we and one of the things is a hundred thousand dollars. And as I stated, one of the things is that you rely on your architect to give you that information and that, <laughs> and we can't even come to agreement. They're not even giving us the information to do that, or um, we can't come to agreement of what those items are. Can it? Can you at least tell me? that we expended $17,000 on the sign. Do you know what the bid was to install that sign at one point? Did we have a price on that sign? There That's was originally in the construction documents, there's a $25,000 allowance that I know that okay, was there so for it's the 25 sign. Okay, so it's $25,000 allocated for the sign? There's twenty five dollars allocated okay. for the sign, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, we have a motion, correct? Yes. Okay. Roll call. Mr. Ture. Much as I hate to do this, I think we're going to spend more money in years in litigation, so I'm going to say yay. Mrs. Rube? Aye. Dr. Hall? Present. Mr. Brown? Nay. Mr. Albrecht? Aye. Mrs. Galbraith is a nay. Mrs. Gasparro? Nay. Motion fails. Old business? I do have some, uh, just need some clarity. So um, in June, this board approved the moving forward uh, with whatever 
I'm confused actually with what that vote was for this facility plan because my original understanding was to move forward and giving direction to our assistant soup of business the authority to move forward with certain things. So what I'm looking at now is the demolition of the sixth grade center that I'm seeing in our FY documents. We are on, I guess, are we on schedule with that? Yes. So when we, when we demolish the sixth grade center, we are now uh, causing our maintenance department to be without a home. And so in our FYI, we're discussing moving our maintenance department to an off-site location in Crete where we will be having to incur costs for renting that space, correct? Yes. Okay. So in my mind, some of these things in little ways we're moving forward with what was presented in this plan. I shared with Dr. Coglanese, um, I got contacted because of the banner that was placed on the sixth grade center. I got contacted by several community members that were already feeling some kind of way about how we've been approaching the situation, who were upset about the banner being placed on the sixth grade center. So as one board member, I'm sharing with you what I've heard from the community is that we are basically getting the input of the community just to, to, to be doing it. We've shared with you concerns about the survey that's being put out where people can make multiple responses with that. All of this you know, being put together, the overall thought from community members that I'm speaking with is that we're really not trying to gauge the input of the community because on the side, we're moving forward with little things. So just letting you all know that. And also, according to that plan, we were supposed to be voting on the issuing of bonds for this month, correct? September? According to the plan, yes. Okay, so as a board member, I look on the agenda, it's not here. I was not informed that it wouldn't be on here. I would like to know why they're not on this agenda. And I would also like to let you know that I'm hearing that it's being moved to November. I want clarity as a board member. I should be privy to the same information that every other board member is privy to and every other community member that other board members speak with. I do not know what's going on with this plan. I have never heard anything about November. I'm telling you what's out there. Okay, well. So why are, why been, why are these not on September? I don't have any information September? that you don't have. So I, why I don't why know. Are, why are we not voting on that for September? I believe that we were going to come back and wait until after the surveys were done. Isn't that what was discussed? Yes. yes. As part of going out and getting the external, as well as internal information, that process was uh, supposed to be completed, and by that will be the end of September for our October. Um, so we were looking to have information ready to be shared at the uh, Committee of the Whole, which would be the first meeting in October. No, the, our October 6th meeting. Our October 6th meeting would be the discussion of it, but then there's also more of a decision. So the, if the answer given was that we we're holding off until what? All the data is in from our external and internal stakeholders. Okay, but we're not holding off on what's happening with the sixth grade center? I, I didn't hear what you said. But we're not holding off with what's happening with the sixth grade center? I'm confused. The demolition, the demolition of the sixth grade center is, is moving forward in that. Um, we have to start that process in that. So we're starting that process of, of demoing that. The bond situation is- Wait, you said we have to start it. Well, we don't- Clarify that. Okay, when I, say, when I say we have to start that, what I mean by that, it has to be cleared out, number one. We're gonna demo that. Um, if the board decides, let's just say in October to move forward and develop a, a plan and move that forward, and part of that is uh, the demolition of that building, 
um, it's too late to start that whole process. So we're starting that process right now. What will come to the board what do you mean then, it's too late? Because if what will happen then, it pushes the demolition of the building of the sixth grade center out. You won't be able to start construction of a new building if you want to put a new building there in March so that it's ready to open in August of 2020. So again, it, it, we're, we're moving in anticipation of the fact that that will happen. No, we're not. So, so what will yes, happen? Yes, we are. Well, but what will, what will then happen is the fact that it will come before the board in a bid document if they would like to approve the demolition of that building. If they don't approve that, then that stops. And that. But we're preparing for demolition. We're talking with, um, what is it, Crete? We're looking to put get space in Crete. We're talking about, you know, putting these things in. What I'm saying is it's, it's, too, it's contradictory. If we're going to wait, we're going to wait. If we are saying we're going to get the input of the community, then that's what we need to do. If October 6th is the date that we will be making decisions, that's what we need to do. We need to stick by what we're saying to the community. And you can't no, say the one we're waiting and then on the other, we're not. No plans will be made until October 6th. If there's a, a bid that can go out that we can get something done ahead of time so that we don't have to wait and say, okay, on October 6th, then we can, then we have to wait until November or December. We can do that. We're not making any final decisions until after we go over well, all of the data. According to this FYI, we received on Monday. We're we're moving forward with this dump, demolition. We're we're talk, We're in talks with getting space. We're we're getting ready to expend even more money. Was that and was that included in the price? Well, and again, we're spending money right now at the sixth grade center, keeping that operational. We're spending somewhere between forty and fifty thousand dollars just in and utilities. and we already know that. No, I, I know that. So with the demolition, we would just transfer that money over to other space and to to a rental space for building a grounds operation. So the demolition is what, like a million dollars? Um, I think it's gonna be more than that actually. I How mean much? It, it was it was budgeted at about two million dollars. Two million dollars. Okay. So this is what I'm putting out there as a board member. I am upset. Because for one, I feel like everything is not being communicated with all board members. Two, we're sending two messages. Either we're going to wait until the board decides what it wants to do, or we're not. But. Apparently we have the money to pay for it. Any other old business? Well, I, I think this is old business, just kind of piggybacking on Dr. Hall as well. You know, just being in the... I, I, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. Any other old business? New business? I'd like to make a recommendation when we do our future academic um, reporting that we open up for the audience to ask questions. I am asked questions a lot regarding academics and I think we should afford our public the opportunity to ask those questions and get the answers that they're looking for. Also, I wanna say that uh, Mr. Brown and I uh, last week came and walked around Coretta Scott King as well as Talala. We all are sitting in here and it's very, very hot. We've gone in some of these classrooms, some have air, some don't. We're talking about being fair. We found out that some have air because they had to put in a medical request for the air. We need to ensure that there's air in these buildings. If we can put an air conditioning unit in one classroom and in, in, in the window window unit, we can do it in all. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, are those not the special needs classrooms that have air conditioning? Uh, no. 
These are these are staff members who, who told us that they had to get a medical waiver because it was causing a medical issue. What I'll say is they told me they got a medical reasoning for getting the air condition in their class. So you have a classroom that's next to another. Clearly you're walking into this one, there's air, this one it's not. So why can't and we're, we? We're why? sitting here, you know, having to pull fans and, and all of that. We need to put these units in. Whether why? we decide to keep a building or not, even under this plan, what is that, 2020? Okay, that's two years of sitting, and it's not fair. I, I, I agree I, it's I, not. I would highly recommend that we do a parallel path. And we look to invest in these schools such as CSK, Talala, Creed, or whatever that do not have air conditioning, have a plan ready to go to pull a trigger sometime next year before school start. Because I think we're underestimating the taxpayers. We, we think this plan that has been put forth is going to go, it's going to come to fruition. So I just, it behooves us as a board to have a parallel path to not let our students go through and, and our staff go through another year in these, un, uh, you know, these conditions that's unbearable. I agree. I, I went through CSK, Balmoral, and Crete the first couple of days of school when it was warm. But I, can we find out, Mr. Surma, um, the possibility of getting air? I mean, I sure. think that was already been, been looked at. Sure. So okay. if you can come back with that, that would be great. Yep. Any other new business? We have no need for a closed session tonight. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Moved. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. We are adjourned. <laughs>